Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. Today we are going to be looking at making LibreOffice, the free Microsoft Office alternative, look, feel, and function quite a bit more like its commercial counterpart. Very cool. Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, Plex, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to the show. This is episode number 577 and the start of Category 5 Technology TV Season 12. Yes! The crowd goes wild. Oh, we're here. Yes! After all these years, you've still kept us around. Yeah. Thanks for welcoming us into your home. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I am Sasha Rickman. And it's so nice to have you here. Um, looking back over 11 years of Category 5 TV. Yeah! Can you believe this thing started in the basement of my home? I had a computer business at the time. Right. And really wanted to be able to give free technical support to users from all around the world. But really, it started as a local thing here in Barrie, Ontario. Uh, people would call me up and say, I really want help with this, this, and this. That I want to do. I want free help. Right. And well, I know. doesn't want free I help. I know. Sounds crazy, right? But yeah. I think there is a place for that. I think there's a place. I've always had this mindset that I really want to help people. So hmm. I really want to help that person who's calling up my business and saying, I really want free help. It sounds crazy, but I want to help you. Right. So in order to make it possible, Sasha, for me to be able to do that, I started Category 5 TV. And it started in 2004, as a matter of fact. And you're doing the math and saying, oh, well, that doesn't add up to 11 years. But that's because back then there was no such thing as live internet TV. Mm -hmm. Back then it started with people asking questions and I would create a video tutorial and then I would put it online so that back then then the next person who asks the same question, I can say, here's a link to the video that I created to help you with that. Oh. That's how it all started. So smart. Then in 2007. Okay. So YouTube started up in 2005, a year after we did. Right. And it was low resolution. There was no such thing as HD video back then. And so with YouTube kind of gaining some momentum, we decided, hey, I'm going to start broadcasting, uh, start uploading my videos to YouTube. Again, there was no live video on YouTube back then. Right. Now that you're used to YouTube having live video, it didn't exist back then. So we used services like Ustream.tv and Justin.tv when, when it came out and, and other third-party services before the days of YouTube. Right. Before YouTube was huge, there were other services. We used real media way back in the day. Like real player to Is be able like to stream -E -E our videos. E L media? No, it was R E A L. Oh, okay. And this was a way back. Thinking like real to real. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of about as ancient. Um, back in the day before there was like HTML5 video streaming online, you had to find a way to be able to stream your video on your website. Mm -hmm. And that's where real media came in. Like, this is how old this thing is. So, Category 5 has gone through several iterations of itself, uh, moved out of the house, and moved into Studio D here. Yeah. Uh, and Studio D meaning, yeah, we had Studio A, Studio B, Studio C, and then Studio D. Here we are um, right. 11 years later in Studio D still since season eight and going strong and having a lot of fun doing it. So in season eight, we moved here. We, be, we kicked off yes. season eight here. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. The good old days. And uh, like it all, it blends together in my mind. This was like the beginning. I'm going to show. I would say you've been here since approximately what? The fifth anniversary? Sasha, where'd you go? Here. Oh, look, look, look at that. Oh, so this a is a newspaper clipping. I found uh, a baby picture. A baby picture. Where's you? I am. Wait, I'm bad at this. There you are. It's backwards. There I am. Yeah. Well, that's uh, words. Okay. There, You're on yeah. the left. And then next to you, uh, I'm going to come around. That looks like Carrie to me. Okay. Look. So then we've got 
Yep. Carrie Webb. Jody Krangle is the voice that you hear at the top of the show. This is Category 5 TV. Wonderful image voice. Then we've got Krista Wells, Hillary, and Eric, and then myself at the front there. Just look at that was... Wasn't that we your first so time young. on Category 5? This was okay. So I don't remember my first time on Category 5, it turns out. I thought that my first time on Category 5... It was a week five, before, or like two yeah. weeks before that day. Yeah, I don't remember the actual first time I was on the show, which is crazy. Even when I watch videos, they don't even stick. <laughs> I know, it's like I was so stressed. It, oh, I, yeah? My defense mechanism is repressing, I guess. There you go. Anyway, I remember the live show, the one that we did... Um, like in front of a live big studio Well, that was this, audience. our fifth anniversary this, celebration. Okay. So the so. newspaper came and, and did an article about it, but that was, that, that was live in front of a, uh, an audience uh, uh, in an auditorium. Hi, Jess. Yeah. Do you remember that? How many years ago was this? How come you didn't put the date on this? Well, well fifth. it was fifth. Fifth. Fi the fifth year, and this is now, we're, we're, this is, so that was our fifth anniversary, so this is our 12th anniversary, technically. Well, 11th anniversary, I guess. But 12th season Seven begins. years ago, right? So, yeah, that sounds about right. That is... <laughs> Six years. <laughs> oh, it's Six years, technically. Yeah. Holy! I guess probably date-wise. But there you go. I mean, so the show has been around for a long time. We're always looking to make it better and better, but we, we offer this absolutely free. And that's a very unique business model, I must say. <laughs> yes. um, people say... Uh, now, as I was interviewed um, for an article, and they said, what is the biggest challenge that you've faced as an internet broadcaster? Mm -hmm. And I said, here's a great idea. Do something that costs a lot of money and give it away for free. That's the biggest challenge that we faced. And yet right. here we are, starting season 12, going strong, getting better and better every single week, I like to think. Yes. And our community is growing. We appreciate everyone who's joining us here tonight um, as we broadcast live. And if you're watching at home after the fact, we appreciate you tuning in as well. And we appreciate everyone who's uh, been involved over the years with Category 5 TV. We certainly love you all. Absolutely. Sasha, what has the show meant to you? My wife will say, what keeps Sasha coming back? Like, why is she, why is she there it's, week after week? Okay, so it's the community, right? You so, think that's largely what it is, the, the amazing community that we've established? Exactly. I mean, you all know, I, I couldn't run this show. Like, I tease that it's the Sasha show, but I, <laughs> I mean, as far as the actual ins and outs of the the production of the show and the content of the show, I am usually a 3 out of 10 as far as participation in that regard. But I'm here because of all of the, just the love. Like, I love what you do. I love that you're helping people. Mm -hmm. it, I appreciate so much the, the viewers. The chat room is a huge thing for me. I and I love that we're on Discord now. It really it means that I can has bring been you amazing, beyond. It? Yeah. But there's something a little bit magical about like it's who I am as a person. I can't give this, right? I can't give what you give. I can't but it's that's my mentality too, right? Like I don't want to make money off of doing something that I think that everybody should just be able to have like it's community. It's mm -hmm. it's like I don't know, like Ubuntu, like the many parts make the whole. She doesn't know how true that is. Yeah. Ubuntu being a South African word that means the spirit of community. Right. So, um, and I think that's really what we've established here at Category 5. And if you've been watching for some time, you really know that our motivation is a little different than the traditional broadcaster in that we are here generally to help you and to, to build this thing into something that is a really great platform for, mm -hmm. uh, for helping our, our viewers with tech issues and, and also to teach you new things as we find some really cool things in tech that we want to be able to demonstrate as well. And there are so many really cool new things in tech. Always. <laughs> Every single week. And this week we're going, to be, uh, we're going to be looking at some of those as we would do. Right. In our first episode of season 12. So thank you very much to everyone who's been watching. Thank you for those of you who have become patrons. That means a lot. It's just a way that you can support us by throwing a dollar our way per month. Right. And that, uh, that helps to be able to, uh, for us to be able to provide this mm -hmm. absolutely free and so that we can continue to grow and go strong. Um, so we appreciate you very, very much uh, for, for being a part of the show. We do have to take a really quick break, but when we come back, we're going to look at how we can make the free LibreOffice 
suite. It's an alternative to Microsoft Office. Yes. But it's absolutely free. It's our thing. It costs you nothing. We're going to look at how we can make it look and behave much more like Microsoft Office. It's perfect. Stick around. For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high-quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv slash shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. cat5.tv slash shirts. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Now, tonight we're going to be looking at LibreOffice. It's a free alternative to Microsoft Office. Right. You've used it? I've used it. Are you using I, it to work? Yes, I use it for work. I have it on my laptop here. I, oh, yes. Yes. I love it. I will. It's free. It's free. I love free. Um, I love it. I don't love everything about like the translation between mm. programs. It's like it's so close to Microsoft Office, yet there are so many distinctions that make it obvious that it's not mm -hmm. Microsoft Office. Exactly. So when you're in Writer, LibreOffice Writer, which mm -hmm. is very much a Word clone, yeah. there's so much about it that is like, uh, it's not word things are not where i expect them to be any guesses why that would be because it's free sure and that's <laughs> that's what everyone uh, that's the right answer that everyone will give right off the bat okay oh, it's, it's the free alternative so i gotta live with the fact that it's different right and, and that's true to some degree but let me just put some clarity to that statement okay if i was a an, as amazing of a developer as the Open Document Foundation and was able to create something that was an exact one-to-one -one clone of Microsoft Office. Right. How do you, as a lawyer, think <laughs> Microsoft is going to react to that? Ooh. Yes. Right. Clear? Yes. So there is a purposeful distinction between LibreOffice and Microsoft Office. Okay. Because if it's too close, if it's too similar, now we're potentially infringing into a space that could right. lead to legal ramifications. So they've intentionally added some like static and some friction in the A transfer. little bit, yes. Yeah. Okay, just enough. But it's up to us users and part of the whole open aspect of Linux and free software mm -hmm. and open source software, it's, it's up to us to be able to control the way that we are able to interact with our computers and our software. That's part of the beauty of Libre and open source software. Right. So with that in mind, what's to stop me, the user, from adding a few little enhancements, if you will? to take my LibreOffice, which is not infringing on Microsoft's design at right. all, and make mine feel and look and operate not exactly like, we're not talking a one-to-one, -one. it is a no. different product, but let's see what we can do to make it a little more familiar to us. Yes. So I'm going to hop over to my laptop here, and I've got uh, Ubuntu Linux up on my screen, and indeed, this is running in Microsoft Windows on Hyper-V, as we've learned over the past two weeks on Category 5 Technology TV. So I'm going to log in here. I, I couldn't tell you why I'm seeing uh, an Ubuntu login screen as opposed mm. to, but hey, there it is. All right, so I'm going to bring up Writer. Okay. And you're going to see that, hey, this really does look fairly similar it does and uh, like even the keyboard shortcuts are very similar yeah i mean i'm not a big keyboard shortcut person in in word but hello and if i control a control b control u yeah control i i mean i can do those kinds of things great that's helpful right but what can i do to make this look a little more and behave a little more like 
Microsoft Office. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to close out of that. We're going to bring up our Firefox browser here that comes with Ubuntu. Now, do keep in mind here, Sasha, yeah. and community, I'm doing this on Ubuntu because we do have a Linux bias, and I want you to see that, hey, this works great on Linux. But um, you can install LibreOffice on Windows and Mac as well. I have it at my office. I okay. run on Windows, but I have... Your Windows 10. Yeah. So okay. you've installed LibreOffice because it's a free version of an right. Office suite that is compatible with Word documents and Excel spreadsheets and things. You can save in those formats. Right. You can open those formats. So it really is a one-to-one -one replacement in that regard. Exactly. But a lot so. cheaper. Right. Being like that being free. Zero like being one hundred percent cheaper. <laughs> yes, hundred percent. No matter what price you find, this is cheaper. So. Let's get over here, and where I want to go is, ex now we're going to do a, a couple of different steps here, I okay. should just say. Um, we're going to set up our LibreOffice writer in particular to behave more like Microsoft Word. So okay. it's not just interface, I'm starting with autocorrect and the dictionary. That's because that's really important. Out of the box, it drives users nuts because they say, my dictionary doesn't work on LibreOffice. I do a spell check and it just says everything's fine and I know there's some typos there. So this is funny. I feel like that this feature is all about me because it's this all happened. for you, Sash. This happened to me very <laughs> recently. So let's... All right. Yeah, so let's, let's jump it. over and let's see what we need to do. So I'm going to actually head over to extensions.libreoffice.org and notice that LibreOffice.org is in fact where you would download LibreOffice from. So just leave off the extensions and you'll be able to uh, download the free software as well. We're working with version 6 point something. Um, so it's important to note that you have to be on version 6 in order to do all that we're doing here today. Okay. So if your distro or if your operating system has version 5, which is still great, you want to upgrade to version 6, which came out uh, in February and now we're October. So it's it's been around a while. Right. So you should have it by now. So it's great plus one. Just keep in mind, you need to have version 6 or higher. Yes. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do a search here for English Dictionary. And you can do a search for a dictionary that's relevant to you, uh, to your language. There are many. I'm going to click on English Dictionaries here. And within this page, I'm just going to scroll down a little ways here. And you can see that there is a file that ends in .oxt, and that's what I want to download. So I'm going to save that file to my computer, and that puts it in my Downloads folder. So if I go into show all downloads, you can see there's my dictionary file. So now I'm going to open LibreOffice Writer. And I'm going to go Tools, Extension Manager, and I'm going to click on Add. From there, I'm going to browse to my downloads. And then I see the dictionary for English. Double click on that. And it is now installed English Spelling and Hyphenation Dictionary on LibreOffice Writer. And that includes... Australia, Canadian, British, American, and South African English. Okay, so now I can close that, restart LibreOffice, and now, as I type, it's going to see the spelling errors, okay. and if I hit F7, it's going to actually look it up in the dictionary there and give me suggestions that I can use. Any questions so far? I'm going to do this. All right. We're good? Yes. All right. So, so far, you've explained it in a way that I can actually make it happen. Fantastic. So, so that takes us, that gives us the dictionary. That's all there is to it. That's but because right. it doesn't come with it out of the box, it's tough. Because, hey, when I hit F7 or when I click on spell check, it doesn't do anything. Right. I was like, I know I spell some words wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, I know I didn't write this entire paper with zero <laughs> issues. <laughs> It's 10,000 words. <laughs> all right. So there you go. There's your dictionary. That's all done and done. Next step does have to do with the look of LibreOffice. So it's really important for me. I want to make this look and feel a lot more like Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. And similarly, Microsoft Excel and so on and so forth. Um, the right. whole suite is there with LibreOffice. So it's twofold. First thing that we're going to do is look at the icon set. Now, okay. If you install LibreOffice 6.1, it comes with something called CoLibre. And that is an icon set that has been basically manufactured to look like Microsoft Office icons, but not infringe on their, their rights. Their particular yeah, rights, yes. Not cause any legal issues. No toe stepping. But there's a different one. Now, I don't have 6.1. Let's look at what version of uh, LibreOffice came with Ubuntu here. 
So I purposefully kept myself held back at 6.0 because I want to show you a way to get those, or at least similar icons, on um, a slightly older version, 6.0, um, without having to um, upgrade or anything like that. But again, you've got to have 6.0. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump over to my web browser again. I'm going to close out of LibreOffice here. And we're going to go cat5.tv slash Libre, L-I-B-R-E, office mm -hmm. icons. That's where we want to go. And the reason I want to take you here, this is going to take us over to DeviantArt. And this is the Office 2013 theme that's just loading here. And this theme was created a while back, back in 2015, and it's built specifically to look very similar to Office 2013. The reason that I want to show this to you is because it will work with LibreOffice all the way back to 5.1. Okay. But Robbie, you said we need 6 point something. That's because of the third step that we're going to be taking tonight. This mm -hmm. icon set will improve the look of your LibreOffice writer and Excel, uh, um, Calc and all those applications, even if you have an older version, 5.x. Right. But we want 6.0 plus greater. <laughs> yeah, for the next step. So for this one, it's going to work with anything, and we've got 6.0, so we're golden. On 6.0, I can just download the extension. On older versions, 5.x, you're going to have to follow these instructions here. Um, because I'm on 6.0, I can just download the extension. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And here we go. It's taking me over to the author's OneDrive. I'm going to click download. And again, it's just going to... Uh, now, I don't want to open it. I want to save it. Okay. That's going to throw it into my downloads as well. There it is, Office 2013 theme 1.1.ox.t. So notice again, it ends in .ox.t. So open LibreOffice. We're going to go back into our Extension Manager, Tools, Extension Manager, and we're going to add again, and we're going to go into our Downloads, and we're going to grab that Office 2013 theme, open, and now that one's installed. So now I can close that and restart. There we go. Nothing's changed. Why has nothing changed? Now, next step. Tools. Options. Mm -hmm. View. And you're going to see now there's a new icon style called Office 2013. If we click on that, and now I want to change my uh, icon size to, uh, I probably want to go large note, yeah. notebook bar icon size in uh, 6.x. Yeah. Make that large, and then hit OK, and watch what happens. Boom. Looks beautiful, right? Yes. Icon theme looks a lot better. So now, the final step, and this is why we need version 6 or higher, is what do we know about Microsoft Office and the way that it operates on our computers now as far as the interface goes? They've done away with kind of like the file menu and the tools menu, and, and instead, everything works in tabs. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's so true. that's where this notebook bar, which is a, a reasonably new feature, I mean February of this year, um, that's where this comes in. And you'll notice if you go view toolbar layout, you've got default, single toolbar, and sidebar. None of those are what we want. So what we need to do is go tools, options, now we want to go into advanced. And mm -hmm. in advanced, you see an option that says enable experimental features <laughs> may be unstable, which being translated is turn on the features that we don't want Microsoft to see out of the box. Right. I didn't say it. Did I say it? Oh, my <laughs> microphone was on. Oh, oh, okay. So, so hit okay. Now restart. And then. Here we go. Now are you ready? Yes. View. Toolbar layout, what do you notice? Oh, there Default, it is. Default, single toolbar, sidebar, and notebook, notebook bar. bar. That's what we want. In three, two, one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Bam! The, the closest thing that you're ever going to find right now in 2018, third quarter, to Microsoft Office for free, if you will. I mean, I say Microsoft Office. This is an alternative it's not a clone. It's not a. This is right. an alternative to Microsoft Office because we want something that we're familiar enough with that we can use it on our work computers and we don't get stuck trying to find things. You're mm -hmm. going to find that the layouts are much, much simpler. You're going to be able to find the things that you need, like paragraph um, spacing and things like that, all 
everything just makes more sense. Now, if you're stuck and if you, or if you want to revert or if you want to change things, notice that there is a menu option over here to turn on the menu bar. Now watch the top of my screen as soon as I hit that. Mm -hmm. Now I've got my regular menus back. Oh, File, edit, yes. view. So I can always revert back if I want to, okay? But then I can click on that hamburger menu and turn off menu bar when I'm done. And it goes uh, back to that Microsoft Office style layout. Would that improve the communication kind of between the two if I'm trying to open something that was created in Microsoft Office? Well, or? with LibreOffice 6, yeah. the inter, um, intercommunication ability between the, the file formats has been greatly improved. Okay. Now, it's always been really good. But what that means is that if somebody in your office is using Microsoft Word legitimately, that is true. they can send you a doc file or docx, right. and you can open it. You can make changes to it. You can save it, and then you can send it back to them, and it will look great. Okay. Now, where it, it may fall short is if you start formatting things with fancy fonts or things like that that your computer right. has that their computer does not. Because remember, with a Word document, it's, it doesn't include the, the uh, TTF, the font files, in there. So they have to install the same fonts that you have. Okay, I'm going to just throw you a quick scenario. Yes. So, Microsoft Excel. Okay, calc on LibreOffice. Right, created mm -hmm. a spreadsheet that my computer in calc would love to print, but when I open it, it's like this big on the page. Mm -hmm. Is that because I just don't have the right... You know what? I'd, I'd probably have to see that, Sasha, because oh, okay. it could be so many different things. Darn, I thought it was just like, I know. follow these Wouldn't steps. it be nice if it was just, yeah. You should Dude. be able just to open it. Try it with the, new, with the newer version. Exactly. Up, I think maybe I just don't LibreOffice. have the right LibreOffice version. Could be. Maybe it's just going to work bingo bango just like that. When I do talk about fonts, this is the one thing that you will encounter. Not so much with Excel, because typically you don't stylize it like you do with Word. Yeah. Um, when I do talk about fonts, if you're on Linux... Yes. There is a way for you to quickly, and we've looked at this on the show before, but to quickly get the Microsoft fonts like Times New Roman. This is okay. important for you if you're expected to be um, uh, using Times New Roman. I'm just going to go into Terminal. Okay. And I'm going to go sudo su because I'm on Ubuntu. Enter my password. And apt update. This is only for Linux, so everything else has, uh, that I've done is it transcends Windows, Linux, whatever. But if you have Linux, you probably want those Microsoft fonts apt install, and I think it's ms ttf dash ms core fonts. Let's see if that's right. No, I'm gonna do a quick search for you. Ttf ms core fonts. Let's see what what file name it is. Ttf dash ms core fonts installer. That's what I missed. So, dash installer. Say yes. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you Times New Roman, Arial, all that kind of stuff. Hit tab, enter. Do you accept the end user license agreement? Yes. And here we go. I'm going to now I'm just going to show you quickly. So here's hi there. And I'm going to highlight that. And um, let's see here. Let's look for Arial, for example. Notice mm -hmm. there's no Arial. No. Okay. I'm going to close LibreOffice Writer. Don't save. Now that's finished. So now when I reopen LibreOffice Writer, it now has access to any new fonts that were installed on in the system. Hello. Highlight that. Now let's grab our fonts here. What do you notice? <gasps> Right? Arial. Yeah, and things like you know, Comic Sans MS. But also, I mean, Times New Roman is a popular one uh, for true. education. Let's see if it's here. There you go. Times New Roman. See? So really quick things that you can do to make LibreOffice, the free office alternative, behave and feel pretty much, I mean, a lot closer to Microsoft Office. It's not a one-to-one, -one, folks. But it takes no. that to the next level for you so that you can feel a little more comfortable with it uh, when you're using LibreOffice, the free alternative to Microsoft Office on your computer. Give it a chance. Give it a try. It's LibreOffice.org. And uh, follow the steps that we've shown you here tonight to make it feel a little more like you're used to. Super. Thank you. And if it's not working for you? Right. Then by all means, go out and buy Office. Exactly. Right? You know yeah. what I mean?
give it a try. Try to get comfortable with it. See if you can use it for a couple of weeks and see how it works for you. Do these steps. Make it feel good. If, yeah. And you've po possibly saved yourself a fair bit of money. Yeah. You know what? Go out and price out. <laughs> yeah, first. go go to your pricing first, and then go, you'll be like, go yes. Go in and be like, wait, no, you I. You know what? I'm I'm happy with this, even if there are a couple of little quirks that are not quite exact. Yeah. We've got to take a really quick break. When we come back, folks, we're going to be looking at Shoutcast. They've gone commercial. How can we listen to live internet radio for free? Don't go anywhere. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, you'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit Category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners, and thank you for watching. All right. I love internet radio because it's quite often commercial free. It's quite often free to listen. Yes. And these days, it's really high quality. Like, it's like listening to CD quality music. So it actually sounds better in a lot of cases than FM radio. Okay, yes. And I can tune in from any of my devices. So that means I can listen on my phone and wear my Bluetooth headphones and listen around the house, whatever I want to do. I use Shoutcast like crazy. Okay. But Shoutcast it has gone through so many iterations of the company and, and has been bought out so many times and has changed hands. And, you know, I, I was using Shoutcast way back in the early days of Winamp and Nullsoft and Nullsoft encoders and, and the original Shoutcast software. And right. Those were the good old days, back when emoticons were a thing. <laughs> Turns out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but recently, Shoutcast, which is a feature that we use quite a bit to listen to music right. online has gone commercial. So when you go to the website, it's now all about, okay, it's all about the broadcaster. Try it for free for seven days. It's all the commercial stuff, plans huh. and pricing. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta pay, you gotta pay, you gotta pay. Wah, wah. Now you're gonna find that the original directory still exists, Sasha. Mm -hmm. It's still there. We just can't get turned off by the fact that when we land on their website, it's all about the monetary end of things. Right. Now, right now, there is a link on their menu to listen, and that's going to take you there. But I want to show you what we're going to do to get around this new homepage, is simply go to the old URL, mm -hmm. which is directory.shoutcast.com. Okay. Directory.shoutcast.com, and hit enter, yeah. and that takes a boom, right back into the old interface, just like we remember it. And you can tune into any live radio station from around the world that is broadcasting through their platform. Oops. So give me a genre, Sasha. Uh, coffee house. Is that a, is coffee that a, house? Is that a genre? Like, are you talking like... Acoustic genre, coffee house? Like, are you talking like, uh, like folk? Yeah. Or, or do okay, you... Okay, yes. You're yes. thinking more like indie rock or something like that okay. we'll or, or coffee house would be like otis redding and and the the great oldies no, I just hits like that yeah yes indie rock that is n none of these things are genres indie rock yes okay so let's click on rock mm -hmm. and then scroll down <laughs> and see what they have so they do not have indie rock there's no. like British Invasion, okay, classic oh, rock, cool. garage rock, glam. And I it's pretty well organized, and usually we're going to find stuff that we want. Now there's seasonal and holiday, which is great for like Christmas music. Halloween's coming, and we like to actually put on the, you know, the Monster Mash and all that kind yes. of stuff is playing on these radio stations for Halloween. Exactly. So it's brilliant. The kids love it. Um, but let's, so you can dig through these. There's classical. I'm not sure where you'd find some of these things oh, that yeah. you're mentioning, like the acoustic blues. Well, I just that's I, close. I listen to yeah, music classical, in the background definitely, while I'm reading definitely. and stuff, so I like things that aren't like. Oh, well, say say you want some baroque. Mind. 
Yes. Right? So you click on classical and then Baroque and look at all of these stations that are available for you in the Baroque genre. Okay. Vivaldi. <sighs> Odo's uh, Baroque music one, from 1.fm, and you can click on that and hit play, and you'll be listening to that radio station. Right. Just like that. Huh. So directory.shoutcast.com is how you get there. Now, we have to head over to the newsroom. That we do. Are we having fun tonight? We are. Yes. Yeah. And your, your new newsroom shots, here you go. Here we are. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. The U.S. federal government has just authorized its staff to shoot down any drone they consider a threat. Google Plus is shutting down after it was revealed that Google covered up a data-exposing bug. Default passwords such as admin and password will be legal for electronics firms to use in California from 2020. And Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, Inc. unveiled its first full-scale passenger capsule offering the world a peek at the future of travel. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. Jeff Weston. Yeah, man. You're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. The U.S. federal government has just authorized its staff to shoot down any drone they consider a threat. The provision was added to the Routine Reauthorization Act for the Federal Aviation Authority, the FAA, the watchdog that deals with America's skies, and has invited the ire of civil liberties groups who are unhappy at the blanket nature of the shoot-down authorization. Under the proposed laws preventing emerging threats section, a new part has been added that allows a wide range of federal departments to disable, disrupt, or seize control of any drone that is thought to pose a credible threat to the safety or security of a covered facility or asset. The key thing here is a wide range of departments, not just the military. The act lists a range of increasingly harsh measures that can be taken against an unauthorized drone, ending with use of reasonable force if necessary to disable, damage, or destroy the unmanned aircraft system or unmanned aircraft. The provision is, of course, entirely understandable. The increase in the use of and sale of advanced drones does pose a poten potential threat to government facilities. After all, it doesn't take long for somebody to think that it was a good idea to mount a gun on a drone. It's not clear what limits and oversights would work best. Certainly a requirement to get a warrant is unlikely to work given the fact that drones can appear at any time and unexpectedly. But limiting the grounds for which a drone can be disrupted or destroyed would be one starting point or granting protections to legitimate drone usage. As it stands, as soon as the president signs the bill, your flying machine can be taken down by a huge number of federal government employees, and there will be pretty much no recourse. That's what gets me is, what do I do if they shoot down my drone thinking that it's yeah. malicious just because I'm flying around? Right. I mean, how do you know, right? Okay, so I can understand a facility, like a government facility. Okay, yeah, don't fly change. your drone up to the door of the White House. That's that makes super sense. Common, super common sense. Sure. Right? But what about, like, we live close to a base, a military base, mm -hmm. and they do, I don't know, excursions. They're probably not called excursions. Exercises, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll say, in the community. Like, they come out and they fly around and they do things, right? So, say I'm just locally in a field and they fly, they drive by, and now I, my drone is in their space, but they've, in, mm. they've encroached on me. I haven't encroached okay. on them. They could shoot me down. 
Sure they could. Well, I mean, they could if we didn't live in Canada where this law is not the thing. Right. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is the thing that's the problem. So it seems a little bit too blanket shoot down the drones and yeah, sure. not enough protection. And you know that's exactly where it goes, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Well, it's. And I, I thought immediately of two scenarios. First scenario is when some guy thought it was a good idea to be a citizen journalist and fly right. his drones over the, the wildfires. And um, firefighters started spraying it with the hose oh. to, to shoot it down. And, and it was news at the time. And... Yeah, it's probably a good idea that if you're going to shoot drone footage mm -hmm. with your drone, that you stay the heck out of the way of the fire department that's trying to battle a blaze. Right. Right? Don't so be crazy. Yeah, there are times when I think, yeah, you're, you're, you're not being smart here. But the drones are a tough thing because how do you regulate something that is um, so freely available on the consumer market? Right. That I can learn to fly on a $20 drone and then buy a $500 drone and be flying a big heavy thing that could kill someone if it hit them. Yes. You know? It's an interesting technology because it feels like it's... F drones are faster than the law right now. Sure. Right? Yeah, so now the law is scrambling to catch up. MPAA, out. same thing. <laughs> right? And now they're like, well, shoot it down. Okay, except that it seems like... In this news story, anybody can anybody in the federal government can shoot down a drone. Yeah, pretty much for yeah. a new reason. And C-128D makes a good point. The, the folks in regards to the flying over the the wildfires were flying in a no-fly zone. So maybe that's what it comes down to: is hey, if you're flying in a no-fly zone, if you're flying too close to an airport, yeah, you know what? You're going to get shot down. Right. Because I would much rather your drone get shot down yes. than take a out a passenger, passenger air, exactly. aircraft or something, right? So as long as there's clear signage. I mean, there's clear signage for things like no smoking mm. and there's or no parking. Where do you put a sign, right? though, Sash? Put a sign when you're entering the area. Okay. Right? Put a sign, but, put a, sign however, a kilometer out saying you're about to enter so that when you're driving into the spot where you're going to start launching your drone, you know. Okay. Right? You're, you're again thinking of the military base where as you're approaching it, it's like, watch out for landmines. Don't hike in these woods. <laughs> yes. Uh, but think about a drone that can fly six kilometers out. Right. How am I going to see those signs if I don't know? So Have maybe an app? Can they yeah, have an like app augmented of? reality would have right. to be a part of the drones. Right. I just feel like <clears throat> it's unfair to have it. It can be. So because that, sweeping. Because that brings me to, the, I said that there okay. were two right. scenarios that I was thinking of. And the second scenario being our very own Henry Bailey Brown. Right. Who flies commercially as a professional drone pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when he flies, he's filming videos for his clients. So... I know that he would stay away from no-fly zones. Yes. But in this particular scenario, I mean, you fly over some military personnel's backyard when they're having a barbecue. Right. They have every right to shoot you down. And these drones can fly miles from right. where, the, where the controller is. It's tricky. It is. Well, I mean, you think about even, I'm just like, as you're saying that, I'm thinking even... Like, say that there's a scenario in a city, like there's a standoff of some sort, right? And a news company goes and flies their drones over, and there's police, say, on the ground. Do mm -hmm. they now have the right to just shoot that drone down if they don't want... They do, public? if they have... Once this is signed, yes. Um, That's crazy. Considering That's crazy. they have to be able to s say, yeah, we thought it was a credible threat. A threat to whom at that point? Well, anyone. A threat to the... They say the buildings or whatever, yeah. you know, the buildings being the people within the buildings. This of is course. a little dodgy. I wish, I kind of wish Jeff were here. Cause yeah, I feel like he'd he have his lend, opinions to share. He'd lend a great We'd perspective start debates. on this because I feel like it's a little tricky. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's one of those, it falls back on how do you teach people to be wise with their decision making? Like the person who mounted a gun on a drone right was not thinking about the repercussions they were just thinking hey here this is cool i live in america i got a rifle i can connect it to my drone and right and, I mean, and used it for target practice not for anything malicious they didn't but they probably put it on youtube but they did and they right. and that sparks ideas <laughs> yeah for the malicious individual right one step further he probably 3d printed that that gun and oh, put it on goodness, a drone sash. And then, yeah 
Yeah, yeah. You just the thing is, you can't you can't just sweepingly throw a law on all drone users when most drone users are good law-abiding citizens that perhaps are in the air beside something that they didn't even right like yeah, yeah. what are your thoughts i mean are you a drone pilot who is going to be affected by this new law once it comes into effect uh we'd love to hear from you comment on our website uh or below if you're watching on youtube yeah. that would be wonderful we'll definitely follow up on that Google Plus is shutting down after it was revealed that Google, Google covered Google. up. That's Google. That's new. It's, Google. it's awesome. It's a new company. <laughs> Google covered up a data exposing bug. A security bug allowed third party developers to access Google Plus user profile data since 2015 until Google discovered and patched it in March but decided not to inform the world. When a user gave permission to an app, for, uh, for an app to access their public profile data, the bug also let those developers pull theirs and their friends' non-public profile fields. Indeed, 496,951 users' full names, email addresses, birth dates, gender profile photos, places lived, occupation, and relationship status were potentially exposed, though Google says it has no evidence that the data was misused by the 438 apps that could have had access. According to an internal memo, the company decided against informing the public because it would lead to us coming into the spotlight alongside or even instead of Facebook, despite having stayed under the radar throughout the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Now, Google+, Plus, which was already a ghost town largely abandoned or never inhabited by users, has become a massive liability for the company. The news comes from a damning Wall Street Journal report. Google Plus will cease all its consumer services while winding down over the next 10 months with an opportunity for users to export their data while Google refocuses on making G Plus an enterprise product. Google also will change its account permission system for giving third-party apps access to your data such that you have to confirm each type of access individually rather than all at once. Gmail add-ons will be limited to those directly enhancing email functionality, including email clients, backup, CRM, mail merge, and productivity tools. Since the bug and subsequent security holes started in 2015 and was discovered in March before Europe's GDPR went into effect in May, Google will likely be spared a 2% of global annual revenue fine for failing to disclose the issue within 72 hours. The company could still face a class action lawsuit and public backlash. I'll say. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I love that their defense was, well, we covered it up because, you know, we didn't want to, like, take the spotlight away from Oh, yeah, we wouldn't, wa we wouldn't want to take it away we from Facebook. We were doing Facebook. this for you because what Facebook was doing was wrong and ours was yeah. less, lesser wrong. Oh, my goodness. I have a question. Okay. So, I... You. At Google Plus. Did Turns you? Turns out I have Wow, Google Plus. you're one of the three people. I'm one of the three people. <laughs> and the only reason I actually know still that I have Google Plus or had mm -hmm. Google Plus is because I tried to delete a birthday that is like somebody I went to school with like 5,000 years ago. And I'm like, why is their birthday still showing up on every calendar? I don't oh. even <laughs> know my mom's birthday without checking. Yeah. Um, so that's why it alerted so I, you. So I clicked on it and I was like, your friend's on Google Plus. Like she was in my Google Plus circle. Oh. But I didn't think I had Google Plus because right. I don't have it on my current phone because I am cool like that and thought it's not on my phone. I probably don't have it. Probably don't. Installed it on my phone. Turns out I've had it this whole time. Now what? It sounds like you didn't really use it. No. So the shutdown is not going to affect you. Okay. I mean, you're going to lose access to the thing that you just installed that you just are like, whoa, look at that. I have this. Yeah. Big what? deal to you, right? Yeah. But what happens to the user that has been using Google Plus? Right. We joke. I mean, you know Google Plus. Had some people. Had some, had some failure. And was it it has been winding down for more than just now as far as google's concerned right but for those of you who have been using google plus or maybe at a time posted a lot of great information on google plus what is going to happen to all your data right like maybe you posted blog entries or things that are really special to you or whatever right. pictures and things your like that your address <laughs> yeah, well, everyone has access to that now. Well, let's take a quick look at how we can, in fact, um, recover 
Okay. Our files. So before Google Plus shuts down, wouldn't you love to be able to back up your stuff? Yes. Can we take the time to do yes. that, Sasha? Yes, we should. I know I'm that. encroaching into your show now, <laughs> but let's take a look. So let's jump back over to Category 5 TV here and jump onto my laptop. And if I go to myaccount.google.com, so you're not going to find this feature in Google+. You need to actually go to myaccount.google.com. And then if you click on Control Your Content, you'll see right on the first screen, Create Archive. And when we click on that, we can choose which archives we want to create. So just scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. There's a lot of stuff that Google has on me. Oh. Right? Where are you? Plus. 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 <laughs> Google. Plus. Plus. I don't know where they couple it, but this is where you're going to grab all your information from. Yeah. So I imagine that it's G Suite. No, Google Help, Google My Business, Google Play Music, Google Play Store. They've got everything else, but... I had to download it special. Did you? Yeah. I thought I would find it right in here, and I hadn't looked before, as you can tell. <laughs> Posts on Google. That sounds promising. Uh, but check, check through the list and see if you can find mm -hmm. it. Maybe you're going to find it a little better than I How's that? That's good. Thank you. Well, so I'm not really concerned. I did post on Google Plus there for a while. I had like four people in, uh, in <coughs> one circle. Yeah. I, like, I, I feel like We one tried to day launch Category 5 on Google Plus when it first came out. And it just wasn't a big turnout. Like, well, I think you might be one of my four people, actually. Oh, nice. I think so. Very I think cool. it's like you Very and cool. my brother and like a, my nice. friend Fabian. All right. Well, let them know. Yeah. You're going to have to find me on Discord now. <laughs> <laughs> Default passwords such as admin and password will be legal for electronics firms to use in California from 2020. The state has passed a law that sets higher security standards for net connected devices made or sold in the region. It demands that each gadget be given a unique password when it is made. Before now, easy to guess passwords have helped some cyber attacks spread more quickly and cause more harm. The Information Privacy Connected Devices Bill demands that electronics manufacturers equip their products with reasonable security features. This can mean a unique password or a startup procedure that forces users to generate their own code when using the gadget for the first time. The bill also allows customers who suffer harm when a company ignores the law to sue for damages. Many recent cyber attacks have taken advantage of the default and easy to guess passwords on the devices found in millions of homes and offices. In late 2016, Twitter, Spotify and Reddit were among sites taken offline by an attack that took advantage of poor passwords on lots of net connected gadgets, including webcams and other so-called smart home hardware. An attack by malware known as VPN filter is currently targeting home routers and is believed to have infected more than 500,000 devices. Yikes. Yeah, yeah, super yikes. Except that I feel like criminals will get smarter. Like, okay, so there's a small group of people who use admin or password or password one, two, three. Like, there's got to be just a small group, right? Or like one, 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 one. Mm, I, feel like I those see are what the you're ones. thinking, yeah. Right, but most people change their passwords, I would think. All right, so you're, you're, taking, you're thinking along the perspective of the consumer. Yes. Who, when I sign up for Twitter, I'm using a good, strong password because I know that I don't want my account to be compromised. Right. Now... The ISP, the local internet service provider, yes. calls me up and says, we've got a promotion going on. We're going to increase the speed of your internet. We're going to install a new modem for you. It's going to make your internet five times faster. Would you like it? I, yes. Yes, I would. And then when the person shows up and installs it for you. Yeah, they just do it. They just do it. Yeah. Do you at any point say, okay, how do I change my password? No, I don't. Right. Oh. Okay, that modem, <laughs> that modem is your, this is a very good example because this is like VPN filter whacks away at these things. Right. So I, as a user, would never use something stupid like password as my password, but 
an astronomical amount of these devices are created with the username admin and the password password. Right. Think about your router or your modem and you get online and you say and you type in the, the type of device that you have. I'm going to type WRT54G. Okay. So that's a Linksys router. Okay. And I'm just going to jump over to this to show you. So I'm going to do a quick right. search for WRT54G default password. I'm just using that as an example. For all versions of the Linksys WRT54G router, the default password is admin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I have that device... My password out of the box is, is admin. Admin. So if I have now installed that device, and this is an older device, and I'm just using it as an example because it's the quick, quick one that came to mind, but your ISP comes in with the new modem and, and has a stupid default password on there. And if anyone does a search for the device you, um, model number, they'll find the default password on Google. Try it with your devices. What's the default password? And so we connect that internet connect, uh, connection and never think about the fact that it has a built-in interface right. that allows the internet service provider to log into the router, but it also allows anyone on the internet to also log into that router if they know the password, but it's a default dumb password. Like admin or password. Exactly. I get it. Okay. Because I, like, yeah, I change my passwords for things that I see. For things that you, yeah, things that you know and see. And see, but your if Your modem, your router, your Wi-Fi, you get yeah. a, a modem that has built-in Wi-Fi, and they tell you what the password is for your Wi-Fi. That's true. Mm -hmm. That has recently happened. Wow. Okay. All right, so, so keep that in mind. Right, so now California companies can be sued if they don't follow the law. That's where it differs from your yes. original thought process of the consumer choosing admin as a password. So this is now saying, okay, if they're going to manufacture 100,000 new modems mm -hmm. that the ISPs are going to come and install, every single one of those devices has to have its own unique password. And now... It's still, you know, it's still knowledge of the person who installed it. It's on the sticker or whatever. Or right. Anyone who sees the sticker on the back of the modem can get it. Uh, great way to get access to Wi-Fi at places where you don't have access to Wi-Fi is to find their modem and look at the sticker on the back because it's probably <laughs> the default password, right? But um, <laughs> the, the, at least they're going to say it can't be the, it can't be the same on 100,000 devices. Exactly. It has to be unique. That's so where this, this differs. Actually, because California is a pretty big producer of sort of electronics. And it's just and the that, start. It's right? just one state. So this Let's is set an example. Ripple say, effect. Yeah. This is good. But is this also a little bit of a wake up call for us to say, hey, okay, my modem that my internet service provider installed, mm -hmm. my router, I, I think I know the password, but. Have I personally set that password to something strong? Is my Wi-Fi a password that I have personally set? Right. Is there a second Wi-Fi in my router? Because sometimes the routers that they install will have something as a Wi-Fi SSID and then something dash 5G. Right. Right. So you can use the 5G as well. Well, that one has a default password as well. So have you set those oh up? My Maybe it's time to just think that through. Just do a little self-audit. Do a little self-audit on your stuff at home Yeah. or at work. And because w if somebody gets in through that basic right. password, which they can just do a search on the internet for any, D -D -W uh, any WRT54G router, yeah. find one, hack it, now they have access to your entire network. They can access your files in your network. They can access your printers. They can, access, they can install ransomware, which will encrypt your files. They can access remote desktop and be able to bring up your computer screen, install uh, crypto miners. They can uh, oh, turn on your webcam and spy on you on the laptop that's sitting on your bedstand. Like these kinds of things are real and they actually happen. And it starts with those passwords being left as default on the entry points to your home. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. You're welcome. Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, Inc. unveiled its first full-scale passenger capsule, offering the world 
a peek at the future of travel. The capsule, 105 feet or 32 meters long and weighing five tons, was shown in Spain and will be moved to Toulouse, France for an additional assembly before it's used on, on one of the first commercial tracks. The California-based startup, known as Hyperloop TT, said in a statement. Um, instead of the statement names the Quintero one, the, the product is made almost entirely out of composite material. Hyperloop is a technology that gained popularity after Elon Musk touted it in 2013, prompting several companies to join the race to build a high-speed transportation system. It envision, envisions moving passengers in capsules at speeds of more than 750 miles or 1200 kilometers per hour through low pressure tubes in order to reduce friction. The technology will be able to propel trains faster than existing methods such as the Magli which uses a le levitation technology to lift the train cars above a track to eliminate surface drag. The Los Angeles area is emerging as a Hyperloop center, home to competitors Arrivo and Virgin Hyperloop One. Musk's boring company also has a base there. Musk, who also runs Tesla Inc. and Spice Ex Exploration Technologies Corporation, first unveiled his idea for a Hyperloop, a tube-based system to move people from Los Angeles to San Francisco in half an hour in a 57-page white paper in 2013 because he was disappointed with California's plans for a high-speed rail system. In July, Hyperloop TT set up a joint venture to build a test system in a mountainous southwest province in China. Billionaire Richard Branson's Virgin Hyperloop One held discussions in India aiming to offer passengers in the futuristic technology fares that are cheaper than local airlines. In February, Branson signed a preliminary agreement in Mumbai for a broad Hyperloop framework and mo mooted a Mumbai Pune system that would shrink travel time to 25 minutes and save about three hours. It's actually happening. Hyperloop for passengers is an awesome idea. In my mind, I thought Hyperloop was going to be like cargo only. I don't know oh, yeah. why. I like, but I really want Hyperloop in Canada because Canada is vast. At those kinds of speeds, do you need a deflector dish? That's what I want to know. Like, how strong would the G-force truly be at 1,200 kilometers an hour? That's brutal. That's that, nuts. Yeah, they have to have something to counteract yeah that just like brace yourselves folks yeah brace yourselves <laughs> you're gonna be like in that do you remember the fair rides where you stick to the walls oh know? yeah the yeah. ufo and stuff like that yeah, yeah so where it spins around and then you can like get yourself kind of in a weird position and you stick forever on that wall oh yes yeah that's Try what it's to gonna lift be your like leg. in the Good hyperloop luck. you'll just be a yeah. suck to the back <laughs> of the chair <laughs> i just i think to myself like it takes it's a five-hour flight to the west coast from here let alone getting through customs getting through the airport everything else yeah yeah i love the idea of hyperloop i feel like elon musk now has some free time on his hands so maybe he'll just be spending some more time doing hyperloop stuff i am so lost on the logistics of how this could even be possible here in canada like how would it be possible with the great canadian shield and everything else like you're boring through rock and I think of the original Total Recall and how on Mars they're digging through with these boring machines. I and it's like, like, that's all I can picture. Don't, don't think it can't happen. We did a railroad in Canada. Somebody laid actual train tracks at some point across all of Canada before there, were, there was any other mode of transportation, right? We can do a hyperloop, especially now that we have... The technologies we oh, have. Oh, the technologies there. Yeah. yeah and we, these billionaire folks backing it. Exactly. Skywriter64 is saying that's the speed of sound. Is that for real legit? Like, it does make me think of the car Concorde um, aircraft. Oh, right. And the way that, you know, people are like <laughs> flying in this thing and it's like this past the speed of sound. Yeah. I It'd wonder. Be a, an amazing. It just, experience. my mind is melting a little bit because I never thought Hyperloop would ever be for Mach one. people. I never thought. I wow. thought like, it's like, put your parcels in here, order something from Amazon, we'll throw it in the Hyperloop. Ding. Like, I just pictured it would be 
There you go. Things. And it sounds like something Amazon would, would do for right? sure. Right? But now it's people. Would you ride in a Hyperloop? Not the I mean, the chat ride. room's going crazy. Yeah, not the first time. <laughs> I wouldn't be the first volunteer, but maybe after it's been running for That's five right. years. But can you imagine, like, North America is huge. Could you imagine getting from here to Florida? How, how could that even be possible, though? Like, we need to focus on transporter technology at this point. <laughs> because I just can't see how could they build the infrastructure for that with all the buildings and stuff. And how do you bore under Los Angeles? I just right. don't understand how that's even possible. Is it, could you just, I don't know, can you lay it in the ocean? I feel like that's easier. Might be easier to lay a tube in the ocean and draw, right? the, uh, draw the water out somehow. I feel like that's... In my limited knowledge about Hyperloop <laughs> or like manufacturing raise it above techniques. the buildings. I don't know. Can you get inside a Hyperloop above the ground? Does it have to be in the bore in the in the boring in the boring earth in the bored earth? <laughs> I ah. I don't, there it's are cool so anyway. many questions. I love it a lot. Yeah. I want to see where it goes. Yeah. Even if they're short journeys, <laughs> even if they're shorter journeys, just to get right. you from A to B um, right. through a busy commute. Yeah, exactly. Or if we had a Hyperloop, Jeff could be here right now. Exactly. From <laughs> Hamilton to Barrie in three seconds. Exactly. Perfect. Before one song. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash, Garby, and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. Thanks for joining us this week. Do and that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Hope season you had 12. fun this week. Yeah, season 12 is underway with one episode under our belt. Yeah, that was episode Done. number 577. Thanks for being here. We will see you again next week. Take care, everybody.